looking and analyzing these pictures, you're able to tell a story as to what happened before the pictures were taken. You know, if you, and this is something that I will approach, and I have approached, and even in the past, you know, I was successful in another uh, murder case, getting it to a reckless, even though the defendant admitted three times on tape that he actually committed the crime. Mm -hmm. But pictures are a necessary tool to finding the truth. And so the pictures that we were able to look at that were given to us courtesy of the state police um, revealed several things. We, they revealed that, you know, there was um, disinfectant wipes not only on the kitchen table in an open position with a wipe sticking out. And that's something that you mentioned in the beginning and then finally brought full circle. Right. And then there was one on the staircase, another can mm -hmm. of disinfectant wipes. Now, uh, no disrespect to anyone involved, but, and, you know, and my house has looked this way before as well, but when you have a pigsty mm -hmm. and then you have sporadic cans of disinfectant wipe scattered throughout the home, mm -hmm. some of which are open, it makes you wonder, is this person doing some uh, spring cleaning or are they doing spot cleaning? Right. And, you know, you know, you're talking about going full circle. One of the cans was in the open position. And the first time I had Detective Morgan up and then Detective Brooks up, I merely asked if they were aware that this can was present. Mm -hmm. And the next time I had them up, I kind of asked them a little bit more. And I said, did you check to see whether or not the wipe, which was um, standing out of the can, was either wet or dry? And certainly, had they been able to touch that wipe, mm -hmm. they would have been able to determine whether or not that wipe had been opened or that can had been opened recently or in the past. Mm -hmm. Now, if they were able to open that can and determine that indeed it was opened recently, well, I think that probably, well, one which it would hope that it would have caused their neurons and their synapses to immediately fire mm -hmm. and draw some conclusions about the reality of what Kelsey Wallace was telling them. It would have revealed to them not only the reality, but you know the fact that they had been had the wool pulled over their eyes, mm -hmm. and so the physical evidence based on the pictures is super important. Um, and I think you know it really would do anyone uh, who's involved in a case, a criminal case, uh, a lot of good to examine the pictures, whether it's law enforcement, prosecution, defense, whoever, because those pictures tell exactly what happened or what is there um, after the event. You know, one other thing I saw in one of the pictures, uh, and this was even during the trial, mm -hmm. was the ice tray on the kitchen table. Anthony had explained to me and he explained to the jury that um, when he walked into the house, Kenley had an ice pack, mm -hmm. a Ziploc bag with some ice cubes in right. it on her eye. He, 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 he explained that the ice cubes were um, Kool-Aid ice cubes because mm -hmm. he made that for the ch children. And so when you look on the kitchen table and you see a tray there designed to freeze ice and make it into ice cubes, right. that is a corroborating physical element to what he is telling us. Now, if that ice tray had not been there, then we would, it would just be what it is, a naked assertion. It is no, nothing corroborates it. But, you know, the ice tray was there. And, you know, the disinfectant wipes were present. They were open. Uh, How important was the Temple Hill store surveillance when he went in there and got the stuff and, and got the two suckers? How big of a deal was that in your eyes? Well, I think, I, I think that was uh, superbly important um, because of the timing. Mm -hmm. um, the allegation was that the child ha had passed early that morning based on his responsibility statement. Um, and when he was actually at the Temple Hill store, when he purchased the pack of menthol cigarettes, mm -hmm. the two smarty suckers, the pack of spree, and the big blue, that was memorialized in that video. Right. And so we were able to take screenshots of that as he's reaching over into the candy canister. And as he pulls out two suckers, you can clearly see them as he's bringing those across his chest to you know, transact this business with the clerk mm -hmm. to purchase those. And so... You know, it, it really is, uh, it's an indicator of the truth, and it, it, it was really important. I know Anthony Barber didn't say a word from the moment he was arrested up until he took the stand. And one thing that I noticed about his testimony is he never wavered. <clears throat> he never, um, you know, never backtracked. He basically owned up to the lies he had told and, and um, uh, I think said a lot of things that a lot of people may have wanted to hear. 
So going going into closing arguments, did, you know, were you glad that you kept it in Barron County? Were you glad that you had Anthony take the stand? Did you did you feel good going into your closing argument? Yes. Um, the short answer as to Mr. Barber's silence is this: um, everyone has the right to remain silent, mm -hmm. and let's just say that. Uh, one of the first things that he was told is to exercise his right to remain silent, both religiously and vigorously, or mm -hmm. else he would be in trouble with me. Right. And so that's why you never hear one peep out of him on the phone. The two things that I told him he could talk about on the phone was how the family was and the weather. Mm -hmm. That's it. You don't talk about the case. Right. Now, he did break that rule, but it was for a positive when his mother tells him, Anthony, tell the truth, tell the truth, Anthony, tell the truth. And, of course, he explains, you know, what good's it going to do? She'll, she's going to be right in here with me. Right. So, you know, his silence was um, at the fault of his counsel. Uh, but I would say that's more of a benefit to him. Um, going into the closing argument, uh, I did feel good. And, of course, let me back up to, you know, him taking the stand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the thing about uh, criminal defense work is this. If the truth is on your side, you really have little worries. And so when Mr. Barber was able to take the stand, uh, you know, take his oath and swear to tell the truth, when he revealed the details as to what happened, I think everyone was able to see, okay, well, that fits that piece. And that fits that piece. Oh, and that explains that. And so when you hear the truth and it fits, you have a feeling of, for lack of a better word, you know, um, mental consonance mm -hmm. in your head. You know, you've heard of cogniz cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. That's where you have two competing thoughts right. and they don't fit. Well, up until the time that he took the stand, that's what the entire community had was cognitive dissonance because mm -hmm. it just didn't fit. And so the way that you bring cognitive dissonance into um, perfect uh, Congress, I guess, mm -hmm. is for someone to tell you the truth. Because once that truth is revealed, everything fits exactly as it should. It makes sense. Well, that's why you have the two suckers. That's why the disinfectant wipes were on the table. That's why the ice or the uh, ice cube tray was on the table. Mm -hmm. That's also why you had the albuterol box on the kitchen table, which would show recent activity. Mm -hmm. um, that's why you have dust which has been moved in the attic, because that would show and demonstrate that the child or someone had been up there. That's why you also have uh, I mean, there's just tons of things that, you know, it helps to bring your, you know, your, your inability to uh, draw reasonable conclusions. When you hear what the truth is, it helps everything to kind of fit like a puzzle. And so what Anthony was able to do is this. He was able to bring to the table and bring to the members in the jury box the truth, and everything fit. And everyone could see that, you know, um, this is the truth because it fits so perfectly. Now, one thing that, uh, you know, he could have been, been found guilty of murder. Correct. And that you know, he could have spent years and years and years in prison. They came back with reckless homicide. Correct. Tampering with physical evidence. Correct. Uh, both of those five years concurrent. Correct. What was that feeling like when you heard that, you know, the jury basically came back with a, with a sentence on the lighter end, or on the really light end? We, uh, you know, I, I was uh, overwhelmed that they had done that. Um, I think Anthony was as well. Um, in speaking about the reckless homicide, um, you know, this was probably as tough of a case as you will ever see. Um, you know, three things make this case horrendous. One, it involved a two-year-old child who is at the bottom of a well. Right. The second is you have an individual, Mr. Barber, who has made statements, responsibility statements, saying that it's my fault. And then thirdly, you have a mother who um, has projected herself to be a victim in this case. And so when the mother projected herself to be an innocent victim, that added to it. And so the culmination of those three factors made it exceptionally difficult um, to defend this case. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as the jury coming back with a reckless homicide, you know, my thoughts are this. And I think I may have even explain this on a Facebook post that, um, you know, the one defect in our um, criminal justice system is this. And it's not necessarily a defect as, as much as it is just by nature. You know, um, everyone who walks into the jury box and takes a seat, everyone who goes into the jury room and deliberates, they take with them their human experiences, their human experiences based on their hearts. Right. 
And the one human element that we cannot extract from the jury system is our feelings. And, you know, my attempt to, was to do that, was to have the jury to look at this case and examine it based on science and logic. Because ultimately what we were looking for are the scientific facts, the testimonial facts, the facts from the physical evidence, in order to try to uh, ascertain what the truth is. But, you know, the one thing that creeps into every criminal justice system, every um, uh, criminal trial, every jury trial, is the human element. You know, God gave each of us a heart. And, you know, that's something we just can't leave at the door when we go to sit around the table of 12 as we deliberate. Mm -hmm. You pack in your heart right. around that table. And so my feeling is this. Um, the verdict with regard to reckless homicide was as much an emotional one, um, straight from the heart, uh, than anything else. I don't think the verdict with regard to reckless homicide was based, based on, the, on the facts. Um, I think we more than sufficiently proved that Anthony didn't commit the crime. While at the same time, we prosecuted Kelsey Wallace mm -hmm. in his court, defending him. We were prosecuting her, explaining to the members of the jury, here's the reasons why she's guilty. And so, you know, the reckless homicide, I think, is really due to the human element. It's due to, due to the element that, you know, each of us packs around with us. We can't help it. And I don't fault the jury for that. I mean, it would be difficult mm -hmm. to say that this man did nothing um, when you've heard all these allegations. Not because, um, in truth, he did something, but because it's what your gut tells you. Mm -hmm. You know, we are all, you know, we are all um, flawed with that when it comes to the criminal justice system, is we take our hearts in there and we base some of our conclusions on what our heart says and not what the evidence is. Now, uh, be that as it may, I mean, that's, that's the best we can possibly do because all of us are human, all of us have sympathies, all of us have feelings and emotions, and, you know, even everyone involved. I mean, Mr. Gardner had feelings and emotions in this case. I did. Um, so it's, it's difficult to extract the human element, the heart, out of the system. But as far as the reckless homicide, we are pleased with it. Um, it was the least that they could have given him, although, I, again, I will tell you, I don't think the evidence supported it. Um, as far as the five years concurrent, um, certainly, I mean, that is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, because while they are saying he is responsible, technically, mm -hmm. for the reckless homicide, his punishment, we are giving him is five years. Right. Um, no, honestly, that's probably illogical. And that's why I think the community is having such a hard time coming to terms with that. Mm -hmm. Because you'll have uh, a lot of people who will say, well, wait, he was found guilty of it, but they only give him five years. And so people are, are yearning to find the justice in that. Mm. But I think the explanation is simply this. If you believe that the reckless homicide was based on nothing other than the human element, that is, our hearts, then you will see why they gave him the five years. Because scientifically and logically, the evidence didn't support a reckless homicide. And one thing I can say about it, you know, this, this trial was a, it was a long jury trial. And one thing I can say is that, um, you know, I saw a lot of respect between you and the court, you and the judge, you and the Commonwealth's attorney, law enforcement in there. So um, uh, do, you, do you think the trial went well? Do you think that, that things yes. played out well? And that, are you yes. glad you kept it here in Barron County? Yes. Um, and, you know, obviously we had the option to change venue. You know, mm -hmm. I've had other murder trials where I've uh, felt it best to change the venue. But when you're trying a case in a community where everyone is asking the single question, why hasn't the mama been indicted? Then you know right then that this is the place to try this case. Because everyone, as they also pack in their heart and their human experiences, they also pack in what they hear from, me, from the media. Mm -hmm. And there's not a single individual that I ever bumped into, whether it be at the local store, the baseball field, the football field, wherever, that didn't ask me. Well, why is he only charged? Why isn't the mother in charge? Mm -hmm. And so with that backdrop and with that base level, I guess, of everyone having questions about the mother's culpability, Barron County was the best place to try this case. How, If you could speak on behalf of Anthony, how do you think he feels now that he's taken the stand, he's spoken his piece, and, uh, and it's over? I think probably if I were to speak to him or speak for him, I think the best thing I could say is that with regard to the reckless homicide charge, he is heartbroken mm -hmm. because he loved the child. Well, congratulations. I know this is a big trial Thank for you. you, and um, come back and see us anytime. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bam! 
That was marvelous. Thank you very, very much.